We're talking about running backs 11 through 20 on today's episode. It's going to be outstanding, and, and we have some draft strategy in those middle rounds that you might not want to miss out on. All right, all right, all right. It's almost that time of year. The time when I set the foundation for supreme and total dominance at my fantasy football draft. How can I be so confident? Because I used the ultimate draft kit from the fantasy footballers. Man, it updates all off season, so I never worry about using old busted information. Consistency charts, auction values, full projections. Oh baby, this thing's got it all. If you want to keep it 100 for your draft, head to ultimatedraftkit.com and get your copy today. Hey, this is Kenyon Drake. You're listening to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Ah, welcome in. The Fantasy Footballers Podcast, back with you Monday, August 10th. The season creepeth forward. Mm. Which way comes? <laughs> Andy, Mike, and Jason with you. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate you out there. And uh, it's going to be a great show. we got another running back rankings show. If you didn't get one through 10, you can do that on <laughs> well, See, here's Friday. the thing about, can, about, a, about a running backs. Yes. Tell uh, me, Mike. The top 10 list. The top 10 list is, is running backs 1 through 10. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, it is. And we captured that on Friday's episode of the podcast, so you can go back and listen. And today, 11 through, is it 20, Brooks, or are we just going as far as we can go? We got 11 through 20. Maybe All right, a, we're maybe stopping. A, Hard stop Maybe at a 20. few extras, okay, maybe. Okay. How are you doing today, Brooks? You doing all right? I'm doing all right. Got any lunch plans? Oh, you know it. <laughs> <laughs> Apple salad! Oh, you can check out the Ultimate Draft Kit at ultimatedraftkit.com. We just launched some player profiles on the website, which are amplified by your UDK subscription. So if you've got the Ultimate Draft Kit, you can check those out. On the website, we're very excited about them. They, very. They have athletic profile data for every player. Um, so we're looking at their draft metrics. And uh, Jason did a lot of heavy lifting here with uh, the analytical breakdown, explosiveness, and speed score and things of that nature. That is true. Things that you know so <laughs> very is. much about. Uh, I mean, look, when you want an expert <laughs> on explosiveness and quickness, yes. you, you go to the guy who is – surprisingly athletic. You go to the B League fan, uh, flag football champion? That's right. That's yeah. right. Uh, you what, we, what we should do is like we did the combine video a long time ago and people have asked are you going to do another combine? I don't think we do like just a full combine competition but if we could get <laughs> our own athletic <laughs> profiles like get our yes. speed scores, yes. our explosive scores. Yeah, that, that has to happen. Yeah, why don't we have? We, we run the company, Mike. We can make our. I'm just saying, I mean, our I, devs can do whatever we want. It would be really fun and probably really embarrassing. We might need to turn the dials up a bit <laughs> on those scores. We might need to scooch them up. I I just don't understand why we're not promoting the profiles on Twitter with Jason's forty. We have it on film. We're talking about explosiveness and quickness. We can cut that film out. And we can put it around on the internet. <laughs> uh, that's that's not a good look. Not a good idea? Okay. Well, quick question of the day. This is the big one. By the way, you can find us on Twitter, at the FF Ballers. Mm -hmm. The community's over at jointhefoot.com. And the big news over the weekend, uh, as is sometimes the case, one of these situations, Washington has released... Darius Geis following an arrest on domestic violence-related charges. In fact, if you look into the details of this, these were three different accounts that mm -hmm. he is being charged with. Turned himself in, was released almost immediately by the team, which is obviously a terrible situation. 
And we have to turn the page. We got to look at the fantasy. Uh, it is a fantasy show. Right. And we got to look at the fantasy fallout of uh, something that happens a couple times a year. Here we are looking at the Washington football team. They have a deep running back room. There's a lot of excitement out there, in particular about Antonio Gibson, third round rookie, running back, wide receiver, Swiss Army knife, mm -hmm. return man. Mm -hmm. And they have Adrian Peterson coming back. We've got Peyton Barber signed this offseason. We have Bryce Love, who basically redshirted his rookie year. He had an ACL tear in his senior season in St at Stanford. And then. Uh, smooches. J they, smooches is there. <laughs> JD McKissick. JD McKissick is there. And when you, uh, it, it's almost it's funny because no one wants to consider him in this picture, but he was signed this offseason by this regime. Had 34 receptions last year. Has played the third down back on multiple teams now, Detroit and Seattle. So, uh, I have my thoughts on the situation. I think most people want to know who to draft out of this backfield how you think it's going to play out over the season, and then I would say the ceiling, the upside of the Antonio Gibson discussion because most people want to know, um, look, I, I was in a bathroom stall the other day that said, if you're looking for a good time, go watch Antonio Gibson YouTube videos. <laughs> it, it's a good uh, time because this is a player. That was not, it was not my handwriting. Uh, it was your handwriting. Mike. Oh, no. <laughs> Uh, because it, it was right next to a Blake Darwin phone number. And I, uh, anyways, uh, when when we look at Antonio Gibson, when I say go watch Antonio Gibson YouTube highlights, that is equivalent to saying go watch Antonio Gibson play college football because he has such a small. He yes. played basically one season. I mean, he he had a very small. Well, he played one season at Memphis. Correct, but he had very he has very few uh, opportunities, and everything he did turned to gold. 33 carries. He was King Midas on was, the football field. He was incredible. Field, yes. So obviously people see that. They combine it with the, what the, he's one of three players compared to Christian McCaffrey in that backfield. So I'll hand it off and then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll close us down on that discussion. Yeah. So we're going to temper expectations and be realistic with what is actually going to happen with the Washington football team backfield. This isn't going to be the Antonio Gibson show week one. He's just the starter. That's not what I believe. I know that's not what Andy believes. I don't know where you stand, Mike, but that's not the case. But, you know, you, you Andy, you just referred to the team as a, a very deep running back core. And to me, that's like describing the Patriots wide receiver group as this really deep, What you know, they've got, Nikhil oh, Harry, a they got a bunch of guys. They've got Julian Edelman, uh, who's been great. They've they've got Muhammad Sanu. They gave up a second rounder for him. Jacoby Myers has shown flashes, but like I think universally, people would say the 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 Patriots wide receiver group is one of the worst in the league right now. Um, and that's how I look at the at the Washington backfield. I'm not inspired by uh, Adrian Peterson at this age. He's okay. He's a vet. I'll give him that. Um, but you know, he was in the 800 yards last year and he was basically the starter, uh, for almost the entire season last year, Peyton Barber. It, it, I, I think this is a murky group where yes, they have a lot of guys there, but I don't think there is much talent, which is why they would spend a third round pick, uh, an early third round pick on Antonio Gibson. I think they believe in the talent and that they want to to get him involved. So if I'm looking at this season and saying, who am I going to draft of this group? I definitely think AP is the starter right now who will get more touches in the beginning. And there's no chance I'm drafting Adrian Peterson. I don't need that on my fantasy roster. So some mediocre running back 26 that week, uh, get some points. I'm going to draft Gibson who is, you know, a great pass catcher. And you know that that's where fantasy gold really comes from for running backs. Uh, so I, I lean much more on the Gibson side. I'm excited. There's nothing that um, could happen better for him than the presumed starter to be completely out of the way. Right. And, okay, so I'll jump in. Uh, it's it's not just they spent uh, the 302 on Antonio Gibson. Washington didn't have a second-round pick. So they drafted – with their second pick in the draft, they drafted Antonio Gibson. They drafted him over a bunch of other running backs in the league. I'm with Jason. Look, 
you know, I've been beating the drum all off season for Antonio Gibbs. I think his upside, the ceiling of this player is insane. Adrian Peterson is still the starter right now. I do believe that Antonio Gibson has the talent to get, to become, you know, it, uh, in a timeshare, maybe even become the uh, the one A, so to speak, of a one A one B situation. Like he, I get it. people point at the Memphis stats. He, like he did play in junior college as well and was dominant there. Like, yeah, the opportunities have been limited, but follow the path of what Antonio Gibson has done. The reason he was at junior college is because look, he screwed up in school. He didn't have the grades. He couldn't end up at a Division One school, so he went to JUCO. And he was he was dominant there. His talent earned him a spot onto Memphis in Division One football. His talent at Memphis earned him to being an early third round pick in the NFL draft, ahead of Keyshawn Bond, ahead of Zach Moss. And this was, you know, Ron Rivera was part of the decision process of saying, "I want that guy on my team." So I'm just trying to follow the money. I get it. They signed Peyton Barber. They signed McKissick. This is before the draft, though, where you have to go get players. You can't just assume that you're going to get your guy in the third round. You have to make moves. Bryce Love is definitely interesting because he had the, the huge breakout campaign where he was a... 2,100 uh, yards. He was a Heisman candidate in his yeah. junior year. Things really fell off for him his senior year. Now, he uh, played through a left ankle injury, so perhaps that plus uh, poor offensive line, that's the cause of everything falling apart. And unfortunately for him, you know, he tore his ACL in his final game, which is... That's that sucks, man. Yeah, but Bryce Love, uh, I think he does have talent. He's a smaller back, but man, what Antonio Gibson can do on the field, plus you know his production all over the field in all asset or aspects of the game, including kick returns. And I was talking with uh, Rich Rebar about guys that have huge amounts of return yards and. Look, the list of these guys who have uh, were top 100 picks in the NFL or top 100 running backs sorted by return yards, the hit list is pretty amazing. You you put your best players on returns. You want to say this guy's great in the open field, put him on kick returns. You know, and it doesn't matter who what the position they play on the field. I mean, Antonio Gibson was a special player or special teams player of the year for the AAC. Oh, he'll do that. He'll like, do that for Washington. He is an incredible player. I don't know how long it will take him to get on the field. And what's unfortunate about the situation is I believe that Gibson had the talent to play his way to the spot, regardless of Darius Geist. I was going to say being, the Darius Geist thing might actually destroy his draft value. It 100% yeah. does. because It's not, it's not just, much of a difference in in the ceiling opportunity for Gibson mm -hmm. with Geist there. Exactly. But now, now you, you don't have get to him. be right. Now the ADP is going to get out of control. There's and a, yeah. I look, I have no regrets about driving up the ADP of Antonio Gibson. I'm very excited about what this player could do. Yeah, I, there's a lot of things. I think the best lens to look at Antonio Gibson through is not this one where he has to usurp the backfield. That is not the situation you have here with Antonio Gibson. Um, you have players that are more experienced, both in third down role and first and second down role, that are going to... It's going to take Gibson a little bit of time. Sure. So, Juco, okay, he plays some Juco. He played. He has 33 carries in college. That's not... At a, Memphis. To, correct. Yes, at, at, at a uh, I'm just FBS saying school. Here, here's the thing. I'm not saying that as a demerit, and this is to mm. quote Robert Wilson. His 33 carries is a question mark about his experience, not a demerit to his talent. He does not, and this is the bigger point, he doesn't have to be the guy to be the highest scoring fantasy output at the position for Washington. This is the last place scoring team last year. Ron Rivera, when he came into Carolina, it took him a couple years to get things going record-wise. It could take a little bit of time, and it's a deeper room. He's working, Antonio Gibson's working with the wide receivers as much as he's working with the running back room. He's also going to return kicks. He's going to be the Swiss Army knife, and there's nobody behind Terry McLaurin. When I look at opportunity for Antonio Gibson, it's not this path to, you know, if he gets 100 carries this year, I'll be shocked. I will be shocked. He doesn't need it, though. I have him at RB41. I think he will finish higher than that. I won't be able to predict when that'll happen because right. he's going to have the Percy Harvin-esque Type. I mean, Percy Harvin, you go back and look, he had seasons with 50-plus rushing attempts to go with all the receiving yards. There will be opportunity for Gibson, but this is, to pull it back to the final conclusion here, 
watch camp. Pay attention to camp. Yes. If Bryce Love is making headlines in camp, it changes and muddies the water more. If he's not and he's more reserved, you know, when will Gibson learn blitz pickups? When will Gibson get opportunities on third down? It's going to be fun to watch him on the field. And I will say, uh, this is from TJ Hernandez. He talked about the the play calling of Ron Rivera. So Ron Rivera in neutral game scripts from 2011 to 2019, he was uh, the tenth highest passing rate. In so, because in his TJ's point was simply, they pa- like Ron Rivera likes to pass when the game is close. So they pick had, up J.D. McKissick? Well, no, I'm just kidding. saying, like, you have they want to pass when the game is close. And then when uh when Scott Turner took over, they jumped into a uh, neutral play script percentage of passing. That's a mouthful there, but that would have been third in the league. Like it's they, not Callahan anymore. This is going to be a pass happy offense when the game is close. And then if they're losing, guess what they're doing? They're going to pass. Like Gibson, he's in People are excited that Kareem Hunt is taking uh, meetings with the wide receiver team. Antonio Gibson is also taking meetings in the wide receiver room as well as the running back room, which, look, that could be bad for a rookie for his development if he has to fully learn two positions. But if if you're drafting anyone from this team, nobody, to me, no one has a ceiling except for Antonio Gibson. I'll probably end up with Adrian Peterson on more teams than Antonio Gibson. The real question I had for you and that's just because of draft price. You're sure. not going to pay anything for him if you need like a start for a couple weeks. I will pay are you the have, waiver wire for you, Adrian yeah, Peterson. Yeah, that's fine. I'm, <laughs> are, is there any chance you have Antonio Gibson on any team here forward? Honestly. Uh, the, the is he honest, worth the price that he's going to cost? I have no idea where this ADP rocket ship is going to land. I would be. I would still be willing to take him in the 8-9 range because of – what I perceive as his upside compared to these other flyers. At that point of the draft, you're you're swinging at every pitch that's thrown at you. We'll be watching. We'll be watching uh, Washington's camp and seeing how this thing breaks down and how, how many snaps he's getting with the running back core. And we'll stay water and keep modifying those adjustments. Hey, look, it's talent and opportunity. He's got all the talent in the world. What opportunity will he have will determine his draft position. All right, other bits of real quick. I guess this is more like... Uh, what? Mm-hmm. Mike Wright hype news. <laughs> yeah. uh, no preseason games, no joint practices. Lewis Riddick said uh, Clyde Edwards Alaire looking real good. Progressing well, given what they have given him. Mahomes said he's wanting to learn more, gets in every single rep that they let him, getting better every single day. Yada, yada, yada. What we think about Clyde Edwards Alaire is going to come true. Yeah, it's going to be it's good. It, look, it's happening. It's it's going to be a good season for for Clyde edwards Lair and and the Chiefs and Pat Mahomes and uh that offense. And <laughs> you want a piece of it? You want two pieces? You want three? If I could start the draft with three Chiefs, I would do it. Yeah, and Ron Rivera also said Alex Smith if he's activated will be in the throes of the competition for the team starting quarterback spot. You brought the statistics up about their passing frequency in close games. It makes a huge difference to me. That number will continue if Alex Smith is the quarterback. But if if Dwayne Haskins is turning the ball over in those circumstances, sure. they're going to have to protect him. And so that could make a big difference as well. Yeah, certainly. Uh, before we get to our running back, tier two running backs, uh, I want to thank Navy Federal Credit Union. Let the Foot Clan know that, look, if you're looking for ways to save more each month, Navy Federal Credit Union offers members a great way to lower interest rates, save more. Uh, they have a platinum card that is perfect for large purchases. You might need some extra time to pay off. Like, I don't know, let's say your industrial freezer just stops working. One of them? <laughs> One of your industrial <laughs> freezers just stops working in your garage and you need to replace it. Uh, look, the platinum card, it's simple. No frills card that helps get your mission accomplished. You can refinance uh, You know your auto loan. And members save more when they refinance with Navy Federal. Uh, you enjoy l- low rates, flexible payments, and terms. At Navy Federal, members are the mission. Visit NavyFederal.org to learn more. Insured by NCUA. Credit and collateral subject to approval. Refinance loan must be at least $5,000 to be eligible for the $200. Message and data rates may apply. Visit NavyFederal.org for more information. We also want to remind you about FantasyChamps.com. FantasyChamps.com right now. 
You get a free draft kit with the purchase of a trophy, fantasy football trophy, or a belt, one of those big, bad championship belts. Oh, they're big and bad. They're, they're, they're very heavy. Uh, <laughs> when using <laughs> the promo code Baller Draft, use that code. You get a free draft kit. Um, they've got tons of great you know, swag for your fantasy league. So you can go mm-hmm. over to fantasychamps.com, use the code Baller Draft. It's running back time. Running backs. Part two. <laughs> That's 11 through 20. Maybe. That's right. Kenyon Drake coming in as our consensus number 11 overall running back. If I had told Jason Moore that uh, a year ago, if I had told him a year from now, we'll be talking about Kenyon Drake in your top 12. He'd say, I believe you. Yes, I would. <laughs> I'd say, oh, did he finally been, get the opportunity? You'd have been thrilled, yeah. I would have said, did he, does he finally get the opportunity to be a lead back? Because he'll be outstanding in that role. Oh, it's for a really high-paced, fast offense? Fantastic. Oh, he already dominated with this offense? Okay, okay, I'm in. <laughs> I have Wait, not, you, you say that like you were ever out. Yeah, I've never been out on Ooh, Kenyon Ooh, I'm in. <laughs> I've got him at 11, Jason at 8, Mike at 12. Jason has taken him in the majority of his mock drafts. And uh, his average draft position is the RB9 right now. So actually, Mike and I are a little bit below ADP. Um, But he's a top 12 back. I mean, you saw it last year, week 15. He was the number one overall fantasy running back. Week 16, he was number two. That was Cleveland and Seattle. Um, He had a huge role in Arizona. DeAndre Hopkins comes in. A lot of people expecting Kyler to take the step forward. And they went out and they actively pursued Kenyon Drake. They recognized the fit, the way fantasy owners recognized it, and they said he has to be our running back this year. David Johnson, uh, we're going to get rid of you for nothing. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, for DeAndre Hopkins. (laughs) What are we going to do with this contract? I don't know. Can we turn it into (laughs) D-Hop? Sounds made up still. All right, but but looking at Kenyon Drake, RB4 from week nine on, Big league winner for fantasy owners last year. I mean, what can go wrong in Arizona for Kenyon Drake? Injury. I think that that could go wrong, not because he has some proneness, but we haven't seen him carry the workload for an entirety of the season. He was on pace uh, as an Arizona Cardinal for 246 rushing attempts and 70 targets, which turned into 56 receptions. That's the 16-game pace as, as a Cardinal. So... We've never seen him be a 250 carry, 50 uh, reception running back ever. So that, to me, is the worry. I'm not super worried about, and and Andy, you might speak, uh, we're all Cardinals fans here. We follow the team very closely. I may speak. I'm saying you may speak to. um, (laughs) I will allow you to speak upon Kenyon Drake. To your belief that Chase Edmonds is more involved. But last year. David Johnson was also here, obviously injured for a stretch. Chase Edmonds was here, but injured for a stretch. But those guys were there. And he, they, and Drake was still, without a shred of doubt, the guy. So to me, what could go wrong is simply injury. Otherwise, he's going to be on pace for 300 total touches, involved in the passing game. He was on pace for 1,286 yards. Throw the touchdowns out because that's not a sticky stat. He was on pace for 16 touchdowns. Maybe that goes away. Maybe he's a uh, Maybe yeah, Kyler's more successful guy. in the red zone exactly. a little bit. Exactly. It, it actually, I and you can tell me whether this is a fair comparison or not. It was interesting because when I look at Lamar Miller, when he was with Miami, 107, 177 carries, 216 carries, 194 carries, and he was super efficient. 5.1 a carry, 4.5 a carry, big plays. Went to tex, uh, to the Texans. Um, jumped up to that 260 carry mark. Efficiency went down a little bit. Still got over 1,000 yards. Um, Chase Edmonds' involvement doesn't change really how I look at Kenyon Drake, obviously ranked inside the top 12. It's just a matter of how much work do they give him? And I think they give him enough to keep him in the top 12 each and every week. He's going to catch passes, but I don't think he has top five potential. I, I do agree that the Lamar Miller comp is very good. It was one of those, oh, he always did it in He's in also the same paces. age. He was 25 when he changed Same teams. ages. And, and so, you know, what did he do that first year in Houston? He was the running back 18. Well, if you're drafting Kenyon Drake as the running back 
nine and he finishes as running back 18, you're not going to be happy with that. You would be disappointed. The only difference being that, you know, we hadn't seen Lamar Miller with Houston. We saw Drake sure. in this offense with Arizona where he dominated. Is what? that 18, RB18, his uh, floor? Somewhere around there? Yeah, I think I think that's the case. And I would say that the difference of if you're looking at Lamar Miller changing to the Houston Texans, like you're going to you're going in with O'Brien, like the Cliff Kingsbury system. Sure. Last year David Johnson faced uh a stacked box of eight or more defenders on carries five point three two percent of the time. That was David Johnson. Like they spread the ball or they spread out the offense, very similar to the Rams, where they've been able to get uh, historically, you know, they were able to get Todd Gurley very easy, uh, light boxes to run against. That's just what the system is in Arizona. So, uh, well, I'm, what's crazy about that is the reason David Johnson's numbers were so good is because if you remember the beginning of the year when he wasn't injured, they were running 10 personnel a ton. They completely went away from it. That's what they want to do, but they didn't have the receiving core in order to do that. Christian Kirk got injured and they just weren't that deep. Now with Hopkins, Fitzgerald, Kirk, Isabella, Butler, I think they get back to running more 10 personnel, which Drake didn't see that few of stacked boxes as as David Johnson did. He's going to have an e even easier time in, in 2020. All right, number 12 on our list is Nick Chubb. I think Nick Chubb is an extremely interesting fantasy yes. player this year. His season was incredible, 1,494 yards, eight touchdowns, 36 re uh, receptions, I think he's one of the best pure runners in all of football, yet you have coming into the season, people don't know exactly where to put him for two reasons. One is, you know, the Kareem Hunt piece in general. Uh, fantasy owners like clear paths. And with Kareem Hunt's talent and ability there, it just kind of, it's in the back of your head. You can't think of Nick Chubb without hearing Kareem Hunt, you know, running onto the field in, in the back of your head. But the inefficiency at the touch, you know, with the touchdowns over the second half of the year was so bad that I think it also unfairly distorts Nick Chubb's season. Like this was a top five type of season if the touchdowns came. In fact, even in the first half of the year, he's on a sixteen hundred yard, you know, thirteen touchdown pace until it just drops off he in scored, the second half. He scored two rushing touchdowns in the second half of the season. Like that's that seems impossible. It's preposterous for <laughs> the you, amount Jason. of touches and yards that he was still getting. It's he was not getting like the same as, as Christian McCaffrey was getting in opportunities inside of the red zone. He just literally uh, he got up to the line and took a knee. <laughs> right. But the fear... Actually, his offensive lineman like, yeah, pushed saying, his knee was, down to the ground. I was going to say it was the, the defense just magically appeared uh the 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 fear though is that second half when and not just the second half of the year specifically from week 10 on when Kareem Hunt was on the field at that point the touchdowns didn't come the usage was still there for him to be great but what we saw was the running back 15 and at the same time over those same games and half point scoring Kareem Hunt was the running back 19 so he was he wasn't that much behind him um, and so that's where the fear comes. People are like, well, he doesn't catch passes. So if the game script gets bad, I, you know, I don't usually like a non pass catching running back. And what if the utilization is lower due to Kareem hunt? But I think what we believe is that Chubb's talent requires a heavy workload. You can't run a team that has Chubb on it and not give him a ton of opportunities to help your team, you know, on, just on the field. So he, the talent and the opportunity will be there for Chubb. And it's a different play caller. This is a different regime now that running the Cleveland Browns. You have Kevin Stefanski coming down from Minnesota who loved him some some runs. Like, like Kirk, He didn't allow Kirk Cousins to throw the ball hardly at all. He's going to, in my opinion, do something very similar of limit the opportunities that Baker Mayfield has, and he's going to force feed the running backs and – I like Kareem Hunt a lot, but I still believe that Nick Chubb is the primary benefactor from this. I mean, we're talking about and with and without Kareem Hunt difference in pace of 1,382 yards rushing versus 1,600 yards rushing. 1,300? What a loser. <laughs> and if you believe... <laughs> why, why, 
what was if that I was, accent? If, yeah, have you been heckled in that tone of voice before? <laughs> Jason, what well, you were like, Jason? It was like Swedish. A little, <laughs> the Swedish I chef. It was. It was. Uh, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Big summer blowout. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but this is what I mean about like it's getting, it's putting a bit of a haze around Nick Chubb that yes. I don't think belongs there. They 288 carry pace versus 306. I mean, this is a player. I believe Nick Chubb can finish as the number one overall running back in fantasy. I believe he's I one of the players that can do that. And if you believe, like Mike does, that Baker has a bounce back, that this offense has a bounce back, that there are more scoring opportunities, and the law of averages, for a player that got more opportunities inside the five than anybody except for Christian McCaffrey persists, there is a world where like Nick Chubb is in the 15-touchdown world. He's yes, in the 16-touchdown world. And then all of a sudden, he's Derrick Henry. He's not you know, Nick Chubb. Nick Chubb. And so Kareem Hunt's going to be a big part of the offense, but I don't want people to, you know, if you take Nick Chubb and you get him, you know, in the second round, that's a steal to me. I think that there's an opportunity there. It, it's nice because you, right now where, you know, you're drafting him, you can get him as your running back too. We, you know what I mean? We've, we've seen that quite a lot um, where he falls into that second round and you can go running back, running back. I am not as bullish if, I'm going to draft him as my running back one. I know I've got him right now as as RB10, but because of the lack of pass catching and and the consistency that I want, you know, you look at that second half of the year where it was like he was the running back 24, 26, 12, great, 27, 5, great, 34. It was kind of back and forth because he didn't have the baseline of receptions. I, I only want Chubb as my RB2. Sure. Yeah, and they, I feel like we're in a situation here that we're in with uh, like the Rams the back half of the year, how much of the end of last year, how much of that recency is prescriptive with the new head coaching staff and how much isn't? Uh, and people don't know because the team was falling apart at the same time. I think Nick Chubb's going to run all over everybody. Like, I, I, I have him too low. Yeah, yeah. When the offseason started, he was higher on everybody's board. Yeah. And then over the course of the offseason, he doesn't... You, you start You start letting the doubt creep in. Yeah. Yeah. So and and obviously you believe in in Baker rebounding yes. and I'm starting to and the offensive I'm starting to believe line, in it too. The offensive line is is that's much, ex that's exactly what it is. Is you have you have an offensive line reconstructed, projected to be great. You have a play caller who wants to run the ball. You have Nick Chubb who is a top five talent at the running back position when it comes to running. I, the 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 formula is there. For success, and and I'm I'm gonna stop doubting it. Um, Joe Mixon at 13. Speaking of doubt, <laughs> <laughs> Joe Mixon comes in at number 13 on our consensus rankings. Uh, I have a nine. Jason at 12. Mike at 14. He was absolutely unstoppable over the second half of the season. The first half, um, very stoppable, super stoppable. <laughs> One of the most stoppable running backs. It was, in fact, droppable for fantasy football. Well, he just he had a couple games where he had, what, two or three carries or something of that nature. Yeah. Like, he was barely utilized. Um, but I, this is a team that I actually believe is going to be better than people think. I think Cincinnati's going to be uh, much improved with Joe Burrow and A.J. Green returning and their offensive lineman that they basically, you know, they drafted him and he, he couldn't play, and he comes back. And so now we're in a situation where – how much of a step forward is Joe Burrow for this offense? I and don't is know, yeah. is Great Joe? Question. You know, you talk about last end of season. Talking about Nick Chubb. If you take the last eight games of Joe Mixon, he was one of the best in football. So where are you guys with his? I guess ceiling and floor in Cincinnati. Uh, you know, look, he's a he's a very talented running back. He can catch the ball, even though they didn't pass it to him a lot this last year. And the coaching staff has said they want to utilize him get him more involved in the passing game really if you look at the the tail of the two halves last year you had a, a a real difference in opportunities the second half of the year he was on pace for 394 total opportunities that's targets plus carries whereas before that he was on pace for 252 so you're talking about 152 more opportunities and and so when I look at this team and I try to figure out, okay, what what does Zach Taylor want to do? One, he learned that Joe Mixon was really talented, needed to get the ball more. Great. But also, he kind of had to give Joe Mixon the ball more as time went on, as the receiving core got injured, as 
uh, the quarterback was having problems in Dalton and you're going to backups and you're like, my only consistency here is Joe Mixon. So I think he lands in between those numbers when it comes to carries. I don't believe that the second half of Joe Mixon's season where he was you know, on pace for almost 400 touches is going to happen in 2020. But he is good enough and he is the he is the you know the workhorse back for this team where I see him as a low end RB one. I'm not super bullish on him. I don't think that Burrow is going to turn this team around in his rookie season. Uh, so I, I guess I when I look at him, I have my doubts. I certainly don't want to bank on Joe Mixon's second half of last year as prescriptive for success this year. Yeah, I was super impressed with him over the back half of the year because everybody knew that they had no quarterback. And he was playing teams like Pittsburgh and New England that, you know, you shouldn't be able to go out and do anything against when everybody knows you're the whole part of the offense. And uh, week eight on, 1,600-yard pace. It's not like he wasn't great the year before. People forget that. Um, so I'm, I'm a little more bullish. I think he has great potential this year. We'll move on. Austin Eckler. Austin, the, the final thing is there was a new quote from the, the Bengals OC, Brian Callahan, who said Joe Mixon is a volume carrier, saying he gets better as he gets more carries. So regardless of it being true or not, if the team and the offensive coordinator believes that I get Joe Mixon the ball more and he gets better as the game goes along, if they believe that, Mix is going to get more opportunities. 21.6 carries per game from week eight on. That's a lot Mixon. of carries. Um, Austin Eckler coming in at number 14. 14 on my rankings, Jason's rankings. Oh. And then Mike has him at 11. I mm. got I got a lot of, we'll call it guff, early in the offseason mm. for not having him as an RB1. That was before our no guff policy? Right. <laughs> yes. But now I see that I'm not, not only do I have him not as an RB1, but it's the same exact ranking as you, Andy. Welcome. Uh, 14. But I think, didn't you have him at like 17? Oh, three spots I'm lower. just saying, you, you guys have met in the middle. Well, I imagine Clyde Edwards-Alaire had something to do with his ranking going down a spot. Sure. Um, ju he, he jumped over him. I don't know if anybody else did, but uh, Austin Eckler, a lot more question marks around what to expect from him than we do other running backs, and that's why he's at 14 on my list. It's all about risk. And Austin Eckler had a tremendous season, 92 receptions for 993 and 8. That was how he did his damage. Can he score eight more times through the air? That no. might be difficult. No, he cannot. Tyrod Taylor looks to be the quarterback uh, for the foreseeable future. I think probably for a little while. I, the way the team talks about Tyrod, the way that this offseason has progressed, the very limited amount of work that Justin Herbert is going to be able to receive, and the fact I think this team might surprise and have more wins than we think they will with that defense. I believe they will. And so if you are you know, halfway through the season and this team is 500 or better, Herbert's not going to get on the field. Agreed. So in that case, it's going to be Tyrod. It's going to be Eckler. It's going to be Keenan Allen moving this offense forward. Melvin Gordon is gone. Now, the first half of the year, a lot spicier for Austin Eckler last year than the back half in terms of uh, the fantasy output. We knew Melvin Gordon wasn't there. So the real question is, is do you trust Austin Eckler as an RB1 on your fantasy team? And do you believe that Justin Jackson slash Joshua Kelly is going to take enough of the early down work to relegate? Because if Eckler gets 150 carries, we're having a down year from last year for sure. Go yeah. ahead, Jay. Yeah, I mean, because he, he's not going – I don't see a world where he Mike gets 100. Mike just said and, that with the saddest voice I've ever heard. <laughs> he, he just said, go ahead, Jay. He's like, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll dig the hole, and then you can jump out of it, Mike. Um, he's not going to get 108 receiving targets again. He's not going to get eight receiving touchdowns. So, to me, the – I, I like Eckler. I'm fine with him as my RB2. I've, I told Mike uh, earlier, I, I've been rising on him because he ex he's exceptionally he's talented. Good. He's very talented, and he does the things that matter for fantasy specifically. So that's why we call him Awesome Eckler. But we have to be realistic here in the sense that they're going to be a slower-paced team. They're going to check the ball down far less without Phillip Rivers and... I don't believe that Austin Eckler is going to be a 200-carry guy. 
if he is the carries to me are what are you know is actually going to be his fantasy relevance. If he gets 200 carries, then he will absolutely be a top 12 running back. I think that this is a three-headed timeshare where each running back could end up in a 100 carry count world and if if you have all three running backs involved, I I just think that really hurts Austin Eckler from getting on the field, getting the receptions that he needs. And uh, so his upside is capped to me because of the offense. So that question about whether you feel comfortable as your one. No. No. He's my running I don't, back 14. I think I would feel skittish with him as my RB1. I know Mike wouldn't. I'd feel a little bit like, man, I don't have a prototypical guy here. I he, missed out on Nick Chubb by a pick who's going to have 288 carries, and then I'm going to go with Austin Eckler who might have 130. Or 140. Sure, it's it, it comes down to what do you believe about the targets because sure. the targets are more valuable. And we, when you're talking about checkdowns, Jay, like a, a dude who – a running back who in his career averages more than 10 yards per reception, that guy's not just getting checkdowns. He's also running Run. out of the slot. He's running, he's running those uh, fancy, you know, uh, Kansas wheels? City wheel, wheel routes route, yeah. where he's, he's getting deep receptions. It's not just uh, – Oh, crap, two-minute offense. Check yep. it down to Austin Eckler over and over. I do believe that when you give a player a uh, a bag, the size of the bag that they gave to Austin Eckler, he is going to be the primary guy of the running back committee. That's a bag of money. Absolutely. It was gold, whatever, Bitcoin. I don't know what's yeah. in the bag, but yeah, it's, you, you it's can worth it. Stuff it full of a lot of Bitcoin, actually. <laughs> you can fit more bit, Bitcoin per bag than just about anything. Look, there's a lot of cold storage inside yes. of that bag. Yes. Uh, it, yeah, I, I get it. Justin Jackson, he's an interesting player. Joshua Kelly is. Joshua Kelly's more of the prototype that you're talking about. When you say a, a running back, I'm, I need a big, beefy man. 220 pounds. Like, yeah, that's what Joshua Kelly is. He was a fourth round pick, and we know that the success rate of fourth of players in the fourth or later, it's just it's just much lower. And I know it's funny to say that as I'm praising Austin Eckler, undrafted free agent, but he's already the outlier. We we've already proven who he is as a player. You saw him over those first four games, really getting attempts that he he didn't see once Melvin Gordon came back, and perhaps that was not what they wanted to do. That's why they drafted Joshua Kelly. But I believe there will be enough targets and enough work that Austin Eckler does return as a running back one. I'm, I don't have him projected to be what he was last year, which was, what, the running back six in half-point PPR? So if he's my running back one, that's because I drafted Michael Thomas or Devontae Adams, a uh, top-tier wide receiver. He, so He's going to be a camp mover for me. It, it, camp's going to tell sure. me a lot about the volume he's going to get uh, as a runner. It, so when when we speak default here, we are half PPR. That's yep. the leagues that we play in. We prefer Andy in a full PPR. Would you be confident with Eckler as your RB one? I think so. I think I would. Full PPR. You're on the clock. You could take Chubb or Eckler. Chubb. You still take Chubb. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but I think I'd be if I ended up in that situation where Eckler needs to be my one in a full PPR, I'd be all right. Be all right. He's going to have, you know, maybe he doesn't have 92 receptions, but he's going to have 80 and probably more carries than he had over the back half of last year with Melvin Gordon involved. So. Agreed. Uh, David Johnson comes in at number 15, 16, 16, 17 on our rankings, 15 by consensus, and it's a whole new world for David Johnson in Houston, and I think it's going to be okay. I think it's going to be okay. Oh, I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. I hate <laughs> it. You I hate ha that you think that? <laughs> yes, because he's the running back 25 uh, in, in We're uh, way ahead ADP, of his ADP. And that's why I hate it, because he's there. He's there for me every he's, single draft. Where I've taken I, him very few times. I look at my rankings and what I believe is going to happen, and he is always there for the taking. I don't like it. And I hate it, because... I don't want to bank on David Johnson again. He looked slow and busted. But at the same time, Carlos Hyde was a thousand yard runner. He is a good pass catcher. He's gonna be Carlos needed. Hyde busted years ago. I know, and Carlos Hyde was fine last year for the for the Houston Texans. So when I look at my projections, David Johnson is a real value in this draft. And I don't 
want to take the value. Well, what does you, that say? There's like a five dollar bill on the ground. You're like, I don't know. It's I, way I, down I, there. I don't know if I want to. I got pick a that bend up. over. It looks really what's, dirty. What's on that dollar? Well, the problem, the only problem that kind of sticks out for me is the fact that Duke Johnson's such a good pass catching running back. So I don't know exactly what the third down breakdown is going to look like. Here, it could be one of those situations in Houston where Duke Johnson is better at literally everything than David Johnson, and it doesn't matter. David Johnson gets, possible. gets two times as much work as Duke Johnson does. Duke is a better uh, yard per carry runner. He's a better uh, yard yeah, per reception receiver. That's the Duke Johnson career. That is though. the experience of Duke Johnson, yes. Like this, this dude just can't give him an opportunity. But Houston's storyline, uh, as we move on in this uh, ranking show, the storyline for Houston is vacated targets. Do they go to Brandon Cooks? Do they go to Will Fuller? Do they go to David Johnson? It's probably some combination of all of those things and David Johnson's simply going to be on the football field more than a lot of running backs out there. It, hopefully that equates to something. Yet last year he couldn't run. He hasn't run in Arizona just for the record. He has not run in Arizona well for two two plus seasons. He caught passes, yep. big time uh receptions and Deshaun Watson has the ability to, you know, just extend the play and if David Johnson's sitting in the middle of the field He's going to find him. He's going to have opportunity. To me, that's where everything comes down to for David Johnson. If I don't really care about his uh, market share when it comes to rushing attempts, like he could get 250 attempts, I don't think it's going to be great. And I know you're comp. Well, Carlos Hyde did it. I think at this point, Carlos Hyde is a better rusher than what we than David Johnson. To to say that David Johnson can hit that. Like Andy said, we haven't seen it in multiple, multiple years here now for, for David Johnson. It comes down to the pass catching. Do we see 50-plus receptions from David Johnson? If that's the case, then he'll return value. He'll be a, you know, a running back 15 to running back 20. I have to wonder how comfortable he was in, in that the too. Kingsbury offense ever. That too. He just Even when he got – it's one of those things that stacks on itself. It's like, I never get a chance. So when I get a chance, I got to do everything, which makes me try to do everything. He – you know, stringing every play to the outside. And I, I was just on a pod talking about that, the the fit where he always looked uncomfortable. And, I, you know, it was perhaps maybe he's a little busted, but let's give David Johnson a little bit of benefit here and say maybe it was the system. If an NFL running back has to take any time at all to think what should I be doing instead of, bad. instead of just muscle memory reacting, your body knows exactly what to do in this scheme, you're toast. You're going to look hesitant. The – you're up against the 0.1% athletes in the world. You're, you you will not have success if you have to think at all. Man, I hope I hope this is the case because I really have I you know, I say I don't like it, but I I look back at my drafts that I've done, especially the real ones, I have shares of David Johnson. I am drafting him at a value and and you say he hasn't been good at on the ground in a couple of years, that's true, but if it was you know, the Cliff Kingsbury system that didn't match up Think about the year prior, right? I mean, that was the Josh Rosen, no offensive line, worst offense in the history of the NFL. Uh, yeah, uh, nobody, you know, I don't think you put anyone there and they come out on top. Uh, yeah, more stories of why David Johnson is going to be what he was five years ago. <laughs> I don't know if I could do it, uh, but he's he's he, we rank him a lot higher than his ADP, which is what we do with the number 16 running back on our list, Le'Veon Bell. And I have faced this decision, Le'Veon Bell, David Johnson, in many a draft. And I'm I'm like at the flip the coin. Mm -hmm. I actually end up taking Lev Bell more often than not. It's Le'Veon Bell for because me. Because of the ceiling. And, and my rankings have them back to back. And I probably need to flip flop because Lev Bell is with the Leonard Fournette category of great opportunity to score touchdowns, didn't work out. 245 carries turned into three rushing touchdowns. And there's a lot of positive praise for Lev Bell around New York in terms of, you know, his work, what they're expecting out of him, the way he looks. And you got nothing special all last year, but you did get, you know, 10 games where he was a top 24 back. So you're not going to get burned by him. You just hope that you get a handful of games where he's scoring a couple of times. He's got the high receiving totals. I mean, I, I think when I compare these two players – the the higher baseline is Le'Veon Bell because of the known receiving work. 
you know that he's going to have the ball passed to him a lot. He had 78 targets, 66 receptions last year. We have no idea. You know, Deshaun Watson hasn't really been a guy that's targeted the running back heavily, but then he hasn't had a pass catching back. Uh, like, like Duke Dave, Johnson, <laughs> like David Johnson, who goes a little bit more downfield um, and and can catch some uh, deeper routes, you know. But it's I I think that you're limited here by Adam Gase, Sam Darnold, the Jets' offense as a total. So I look at Lev Bell as a guy who is uh, a low floor, low ceiling. I don't see a great year for Lev Bell in the cards. I know his touchdowns, you, you say it should be higher from the touches he had. I think he gets fewer touches this season. And uh, Well, the, you, you have him ranked exactly where he finished. Yeah, that's well, that's basically now, where he, I... Which is still five spots ahead of ADP. His range of outcomes... Which is 17, by the way. Last year, he was RB17 on a disgusting year. Yeah, the range of outcomes to me is very limited. I feel like he's going to be a safe meh. Like 16 to 17. <laughs> yeah, that's somewhere the, around the floor there. ceiling. Yeah. Um, no, I, I mean, it's hard not to look at the team and the surroundings when you see Lev's situation. If the offensive line makes a significant move that's forward, the big question. that's where ceiling can be achieved for Le'Veon Bell. They tried. I think he can be an RB1. Yeah, they, Mike, do you? Do, do I think he can be an RB1? Yes. Yes, okay. 100%. Okay. So we see a little bit higher ceiling than Jason sees, and it's been, it's been gross in New York, so I don't, I mean... I don't blame anybody for passing on that experience for 16 games in 2020. Chris Carson, 17 on our list. Melvin Gordon at 18. Melvin Gordon's actually going, uh, both of these guys, 16 and 17 by ADP. Um, so we're a little bit lower, I think, on Melvin Gordon. At least Mike is. Yep. Uh, so Carson, Gordon, what are the headlines here you would want to get into? I mean, Carson last year from weeks 1 through 10 was the RB7. Everything got off to a great my guy type of start. Well, except, for the, except for the fumbles. Well, I, I would say the vast majority of the season was excellent for Chris Carson. The headline to me that is Chris Carson is we are still waiting for that full confirmation that he's going to go, he's going to be the guy week one. Once that confirmation comes in, uh, he's too low for our rankings. And Jay, you have him the lowest right now at 21. Tomorrow, Pete Carroll, Peach Cobbler comes out and says, he's, he's smacking on his gum, but says, yeah. Chris Carson, he is... Good to go. He's starting week one. How high do you think he jumps in your rankings? Or does he just stay there at 21? No, I mean, full full bill of health. He's ready to go. He's a, a full go, which we, we could find that out today. I mean, you know, more field work is going to happen at camp um, starting, you know, this week. So when, when I know he's got a full healthy slate, I'm going to move him up because – you look at all these players we're talking about, the question marks, right? Is Love Bell going to be better than he was last year? I don't know. How's David Johnson is going to catch the ball? Melvin Gordon's got a new team. Chris Carson, the only question is the health. So if he's healthy coming in, he was already successful. He was already the lead back on this team. It's a great offense. There's continuity everywhere. I would rather take my shot on Chris Carson from this range. But one thing I, I did want to point out, we're talking about all – I mean, listen to these – Listen to these running backs. Uh, we're, we haven't got to Todd Gurley and, you know, uh, James Conner yet. The, these just giant question marks in these rounds, three, four, five, and the wide receivers are so good there. This, right. is, this is why, like, when I, when, I, when I go through this, I don't want this decision. I don't <laughs> want to be like, well, who in do other you words, have you're to going take? Melvin Gordon or, or Lev Bell. I don't want. So does that mean you're passing on wide receivers early so that you don't have to make this decision because you like the wide receivers here so much, you don't want to make the Lev Bell, David Johnson, Chris Carson, Melvin Gordon decision at all? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I, I feel like we're always about stay water. Let the draft come to you, and that's, that's the right way to play it. You know, Don't go in and say, I'm running back, running back. But for some reason this year, and, and I think this is the reason, the, the question marks in, in this category of running back and the the wide receivers that I just love that are being pushed down because of how early running backs are going, I I just feel like I can't imagine not going running back, running back right now in a draft due to these players. Carson and Nick Chubb were not very different stat line wise last year. I mean, obviously Chubb had a, a, a couple hundred more rushing yards, but opportunity wise, receptions, those type of numbers, very similar. And then Melvin Gordon, nobody knows what's going to happen here in Denver. 
Is Drew Locke legit? Is Melvin well, Gordon going to get the majority of the workload? I think so. But there are to me for Melvin Gordon, the 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 theme of the day now is just questions, and they are just the wheel barrel full of questions. Thank you. It's a barrel. <laughs> I forgot that you are familiar with the barrel term. Look, two it, years, sixteen million dollars. The the question marks are just so outrageous. Of he has been an inefficient runner his entire career. Yes, teams view him as a guy who can handle the the workload, be a true three down running back. But he has made his fantasy points with touchdowns, and he has made his fantasy points with receptions. If, like looking at the Austin Eckler situation of, oh well, holy crap! You know his targets are going to go way down. Why is that? Because he doesn't have Philip Rivers throwing him the ball anymore. Melvin Gordon also does not have Philip Rivers throwing him the ball. We saw a very small sample of Drew Locke, but in that small sample, it was I don't throw to my running backs. And Philip Lindsay has been great for two years, a thousand yard rusher, uh, both seasons. If if I'm remembering that correctly. Meanwhile, you have Melvin Gordon, who's done that one time. Like I know he has the money. The, well, the let, money let says that Melvin Gordon's either, the guy. Okay? Because I think people don't realize this. Melvin Gordon was so tremendously good last year. He is, like you said, it's on the receiving uh, area. Yeah. He had to contend with Austin Eckler last year, still ends up the RB9 on a team that was going downhill to the point of drafting Justin Herbert in the first round. Uh, RB9 from week seven on, contending with Austin Eckler. I think the reason we're much higher than you is because we expect just about all the receiving work to go to Melvin Gordon in this offense. Is that a, is that what you believe, Jason? Yeah, they, they've they never utilized Philip Lindsay as a pass-catching back. They brought in Melvin Gordon, I believe, to be a uh, more diverse skill set. I mean, they, they paid him a lot of money, and I think they know that they need that outlet for Drew Locke. So that is the difference here. It's just a matter of will he get the receptions or will he not? He has his entire career. He's being paid to do what he's done in the past. And I not think not a great the, offensive line situation. I think that the team uh is is better with Melvin Gordon. I really do. I know he's not efficient, but you know, some players have a nose for the goal line and he always has. He's well rounded. He can carry, you know, a, a heavy workload. So I do think that they are moving on more from Phil Blinsey. Not that he's not going to be involved, but He's not the pass catching guy, and he's not the goal line guy. And if Melvin Gordon is both of those things, then you know you might not love the 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 offensive outlook. For... So does he get 250 touches, Mike? 250 total touches. Sure. So then it comes down to touchdowns. Yeah. So we brought that stat up before, where 95 percent of running backs over the last 25 years, when they hit 250 and eight touchdowns, that makes them top 15. Yeah. So but does it, he get to eight? But is it you know is he averaging? five targets a game like he did last year yeah i mean that to me the answer is a resounding no right but if he gets 250 touches overall that's going to do enough damage to probably have him higher than where you have him ranked right now sure. melvin gordon is uh he's just one of those players i i You're accept kind of i accept on. my yep. fate if i'm wrong on melvin gordon so be it. Oh, and that's one of those lessons for fantasy football. Don't You're not backed into taking any of these guys. I mean, just because they're in an ADP list or on the UDK rankings. If you don't believe something about a player, it's your team. Please don't take them. Move on to... And I, I mean, won't. There's enough running backs in this tier of Oh, my, of I just sadness. remembered he's on my League of Record team. <laughs> Congratulations, Mike. Ah, you said, oh, I won't, but he's one of your keepers? <laughs> Yes, he is. <laughs> well, that'll be, I mean. It's terrible. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of win-win for you now, right? If he does great, at least he pays out for you in fantasy. Look, Melvin Gore's going to be amazing yeah, change for your, fantasy Hold on, give me a whole new <laughs> I, I perspective think, now that you rediscovered him. I think it's called a win-loss. <laughs> like, it's just, it's just hedged because he's going to lose somewhere. It's and a hedge. Win somewhere. Yeah. yeah, you're either going to be right on your prediction and your team's going to suck, or you win. So Let's talk about a guy that Mike loves, Todd Gurley. <laughs> Take it away, Mike. Tell about how great a receiving back Todd Gurley is. Uh, what the guy? We've been here, done that. <laughs> yeah, look, Gurley he... at nineteen. By the way, James Conner at twenty to round out this episode. Gurley, I almost want to refer people just to the Fire and Ice episode. Because That's exactly where you need to go. We had a huge discussion on Todd Gurley. Mike is not a believer. 
if if there was a you know we have our my guys every year if we had the like negative version of that mm-hmm. where you picked three busts for this season i guarantee you ty Gurley is in mike's you are 100 uh, percent correct in his not my guys that is correct <laughs> it <would> your be- <laughs> guys todd Gurley, <laughs> melvin gordon and todd Gurley. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, do, you, do you guys want to try and make the case for of him? Of course not. I would rather be dead. Uh, I, I kind of do. I know that I stand apart from you two, but I do think that, you know, he is a, he is way, not close. I think he, last year, just as a player, realized he was inefficient. He wasn't being thrown to on the routes run, but he's still way better than Devonta Freeman. Devonta Freeman looked like a, a running back who was DUN, completely incapable of doing anything on the field. They moved on, and they're going to need him. There's a lot of vacated targets. He is he his depth. The depth chart is just him. So this is a good offense. And Brian Hill. I am not worried about Brian Hill. I'm not worried about Ito Smith. I am the depth chart to me is Todd Gurley and, and Brian Hill and fodder. Sure. I mean, yes, that is the official depth chart, but I'm not worried about them. So if he does get past two more, maybe he's not worthy of every single one of those passes, but it, it doesn't matter if, if he ends up with 50 receptions, which is well within the range of outcomes for a team that's always passed the ball to the running back for a good offense and 200 plus carries, he's going to be valuable for fantasy. Well, he's being drafted much higher than all of us, including Jason. He's drafted as the RB 15. He's got great name value. He's got, uh, he's going into an offense that we know will be good. It's all about opportunity for me. Does he get enough of it? Um, uh, does Brian Hill exist, I think, is a question that has now been brought up. Does he have a role in this backfield? Connor at 20 rounds out this episode. Um, I, you know, James Connor is an interesting case because I think you're going to end up, he, his average draft position is probably not really where Agreed. he's going to finish. I, I totally and, agree. And there are a handful of guys in that category. I would actually say Chris Carson's in the exact same category if we don't get any clarity on his uh, health. Like if he just status quo right now, you'd be like, well, Carson's either going to be the guy and be much higher than this spot, which is the same case for Connor, or he's going to get hurt and fumble, which is, the same, you know, if Connor gets hurt, which he's always done, I mean, then you got a huge problem and he's not the RB18 where he's being drafted. But if he's not hurt, he's probably not the RB eighteen where he's being drafted. He's probably much higher than that. Yeah, he will. He will get an absolute uh, boatload of opportunity. He is the best running back on the team now. There's uh, whispers from the bushes that Jalen Samuels will not make the team. Which look, that's probably more a uh, a note for Anthony McFarland than it is for for James Conner. But time after time after time, Coach Tomlin has showed us who he is, and that's a coach that wants one running back on the field. Tom- <laughs> Thank you, Jason. That, You're ex- welcome. that was excellent. Uh, and if James Conner is on the field all the time with an actual healthy uh, Hall of Fame quarterback, Ben Roethlisberger, then James Conner is going to be very, very valuable for fantasy. He does, uh, he does appear to be fragile, especially last year. It was rough. It wasn't just missed games. It would be games you thought you could depend on him. And then he would leave with another nagging injury. But when does that frustration boil over for the team if it happens early as well? Because they both, sure. the GM and the head coach, came out and said, "Look, this is not what." They were actually frustrated with Connor. It wasn't like, "Oh, he had bad luck." It was like, "This, this is not how we can't have a running back like right. this." Right? Yeah. The, look, uh, ability to be on the field, or availability is an ability to. Oh, there you go. Two coaches. Yeah. I, Very l- nice. Let me ask you this philosophically: take the name out. It's not James Connor. It's just an idea. You are in. Okay. Are, I like it. Yeah. I like it. Here you go. You are in the back of the third. You're at the, the turn. So All you right. could, the last pick in the third round, first pick in the fourth round. And I say to you, I am your local wizard. And I say to you, I will give you a player who you have a 50% chance that he is a top five running back in fantasy and a 50% chance. That you waste the pick. You waste the pick. Would you do that at the three four turn? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's James Conner. So draft him because that's how I view him. I don't think the top five potentials there with the other running backs, and that if, would be my only dispute. Like if you said top ten there, if he plays sixteen games, 
and is healthy all season. He's yeah, top no, eight. I agree with that. He, he, I mean, he he was he was the running back six in thirteen games two years ago, so he is talented. I just like other guys more. I, sure, I think you'd have I mean, to be you'd be kicking Alvin Kamara down the line, or you're kicking, you know, Derrick Henry down the line. But uh, when he's been on the field and he's been healthy, he's been dominant. Yep. Will you get that? Fifty fifty might be generous. <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess that's 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 maybe the right. real problem. All right, we're gonna have to close this thing down. I don't want any explanation here. I just want an answer. Favorite running back outside the top twenty for me, it's David Montgomery, Mark Ingram, Jonathan Taylor. All right, we want to thank Pristine Auction for sponsoring the show. You can check them out at pristineauction.com. Use the code Ballers, you get a ten dollar credit. Hundreds and hundreds of daily auctions on some amazing sports memorabilia. Mike just cracked open a Blake Jarwin jersey. I don't know if that's a secret. If you get $10 credit, oh, it's on the wall. Oh, my gosh. Guess it's not a secret, is it? Check them out, pristineauction.com. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com. And follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers. And Foot Clan, don't forget the Navy Federal Credit Union offers members great ways to lower their interest rates and save more. You can get their low rate card, the platinum card, to pay off some purchases over time or refinance your auto loan uh, with Navy Federal. At Navy Federal, members are the mission. Visit NavyFederal.org to learn more. Insured by NCUA. Credit and collateral subject to approval. Refinance loan must be at least $5,000 to be eligible for the $200. Message and data rates may apply. Visit NavyFederal.org for more information.